On Monday morning, you get a phone call from a building owner. Her son has just graduated from the world's top landscape architecture school, and she has asked him to design rooftop gardens for all of her buildings. She would like to put a planter that looks like this all over her roof. Her current structural engineer is saying that it's going to require a major roof upgrade, but she thinks they're being overly conservative. She would like you to take a look at it and give her a second opinion. If you can make it work with minor upgrades, she would consider giving you the rest of the buildings in her portfolio. So the question is, how do you figure out the load shape of this planter on your beams? This is Structural Python. <laughs> These are my original notes from when I first started working on this problem. The way I saw this is if I've got a polygon in the trib region of my beam, then I need to figure out the projection of the polygon onto the beam. In other words, if I were to draw lines at every location in between here, what I need to know is what are the length of all the lines as they stack up onto the beam. So with a polygon that's say this shaped, we would end up with a trapezoidal shape like this. So one solution to this might be to say, discretize all of these lines into a bunch of points, and then to put hundreds of points to describe this shape. The problem with this is that you're always gonna to have to make some decision about how many points you're gonna to use to discretize each of these lines, but they're also all piecewise linear, so we don't really need to have hundreds of points in there because we can just linearly interpolate in between the key uh, regions, which are the regions where, or the points, where the slope changes. So we'd say here, 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 and here is all we need to know is what is basically this delta y. The delta y, of course, being defined by these two lines that create this overlap region. So if we've got line two here and line one here, we've got two equations to describe the line, and delta y is just going to be y2 minus y1. And so by knowing each of these x locations, we can figure out our delta y. Now the tricky part is when we start looking at polygons that have these concave regions, like our planter example, how do we figure out what the projected load is at these locations because, say, we will have a load from this line and that line but nothing in the middle. So we have to be able to subtract this uh, overlap region wherever there's a concave shape. And furthermore, if there's also a hole, we need to be able to subtract that region from our total load also. And so now the question is, how do we implement this in Python? I'm going to be using Shapely to handle the 2D geometry calculations. I've got four basic test shapes that I'm going to be using to validate my calculations. And I've got these stored down here so we can always refer to them. So this is the overlap region. We've got some line A and some line B. And the extent of the overlapped region of these two lines is defined by the start of line B and the end of line A. So between XB0 and XA1. This is the data type that I designed for my overlap. I'm going to be containing the information about the x0 and x1, the start and end points of the overlap region, along with the slope and y-intercept of line A above and the slope and y-intercept of line B below. So I need to get an overlap region from a polygon. And I'm going to break this up into three functions here. First, we need to figure out what is x0 and what is x1. What is the region over which these two line segments overlap, if they overlap at all. If we find that there is no overlap, then we just return none. So now we've got a function to figure out if two lines overlap, what we need to do is pass it two lines, the start point and end point of line segment A, and the start point and end point of line segment B. If these two things overlap, and we get some value other than none, then figure out the slope and y-intercept of line A, the slope of line intercept of line B, and now that is our overlap region for those two lines. Now we can figure out what the overlap region is. Now we have to loop through all of the possible combinations of line segments within our given polygon. So at the end of this, we're gonna get a list of overlap regions for a given polygon. So, 
We've got the square 45 here. We've got four lines. One, two, three, four. So we've got this line overlaps this line, this line overlaps this line, therefore we've got two overlap regions. What about this square Pac-Man? Whoa, we got a lot of overlap regions. What do those possibly mean? Well, we've got, say, one, two, three, four, five line segments here. So if we've got one overlaps two, one also overlaps three, but in between there's a void space. One also overlaps four, but it doesn't overlap five. So we've got three overlaps here, then two overlaps three, and two overlaps four, and then three overlaps four as well. So that's a total here of six overlaps. So when we have an overlap and closing a void space, let's look at this overlap for the square Pac-Man that we had. We've got two overlaps here that actually enclose spaces where we need to keep track of the area. And that's A overlapping B, and also line C overlapping D. A overlapping D has a void space here. So all these ones that are marked red are describing overlap regions that contain either entirely void space or partially contain some void space. So we need to figure out which of these are going to be actually adding area to our distributed load and which ones are gonna be subtracting area from our distributed load. To do that, we're gonna be using this concept here of a convex hull to find where the void regions are. So if we've got the square Pac-Man shape, this geometric construction of the convex hull, you can think of as being like, if you wrapped an elastic band around your shape, that's what the shape would be, would be the convex hull of the shape. So in this case with our square Pac-Man, the convex hull is just the square. So to get the void region, we can simply get the convex hull, subtract the polygon, and we'll be left with the void region remaining. So we'll write a function here to get the void regions. We'll pass it a polygon, and we will check to see if it has any void regions being defined as the convex hull minus the polygon. Square Pac-Man, let's look at the void regions. We see the triangular void region that's very apparent. Same with the bow tie. We'll see two, and with our square with L hole, we should see this L hole. There's our void region. My thought is, if we convert these overlap regions into another data type called a singularity function, then we can compose singularity functions together to subtract negative area from our positive area. So if we've got our overlap region, what would a singularity function be here? We've got y0 and y1 being the start and end points of our delta y of our overlap region here, and we've got xb0 and xa1 being the x0 and x1 extents of our overlap region. The singularity function would be describing this projected shape onto the beam. So how do we actually put that into Python code? It's beautifully simple, and I'm a big fan of using singularity functions in Python code because it makes the code more expressive and it reduces the amount of saying if, elif, else clauses that you have in your code, which make things a lot more complicated. So the idea here is we've got void regions and partial void regions, so how do we know and how are we gonna be able to sort of add and subtract them? The idea here is to compose singularity functions. So if we've got some uh, region here that contains a triangular void space, we can take this partial void region here where it's got say real substance, real material, and then a void region, subtract the void region and get just the, uh, the main area remaining. So we need to define a singularity function in Python. What could be a way of doing this? This is how I approached it. I created a data class of a singularity. I defined the x0 and x1, which we can get directly from our overlap object. We've got the slope, and we've got y0, which is the starting point of the, the singularity region. Because we're describing this as a singularity function, I thought it would be very expressive to make this a callable class. So I can instantiate a singularity instance and then call it like it's a function. In a sense, I'm preloading the function with all of my data about x0, x1, the slope, y0, 
and then I can pass it x values and it will kick out y values for me. So what did I do here? I'm saying I want to return the value of this expression here. Because I want to be able to compose these and I want to be able to subtract singularity functions, I wanted to also define what a negative singularity function is. A negative singularity function is going to be one that's the exact same as whatever it was before, but with a minus slope, a negative slope, and a negative y naught value. So for the square Pac-Man shape, I've got this region here that I'm looking at, the A overlapping B. So A overlaps B at x naught, x equals 5, it ends at x equals 10. The slope of A is 0, the slope of B is 1, and the y-intercept of A is 10, and the y-intercept of B is 0. The resulting singularity function would look like this. x naught is at 5, x1 is at 10, the slope here is negative 1, and the y naught value is 5. This is a representation of the singularity function here. Moving on, we're going to be looking at how to generate singularity functions from polygons. The general idea here is to assume that the shape P, the polygon, is going to be convex. In the event that it is not, then we will subtract the void region from it and then assume that the void region itself is convex. If it is not, then we will recursively call this function again and go into breaking out each concave void region until we get convex regions. So using recursion, we'll be able to step into any shape and be able to generate a list of convex polygons and convex void regions to be subtracted from the convex polygon to handle any amount of openings or holes. Finally, when we've got a list of singularity functions, we're going to want to convert those into polygons. The resulting polygon is going to represent the distributed load on our beam. So if we were to look at square with L hole, here is the distributed load resulting from this shape. Along with it here are the coordinates of the polygon that we can use to describe each section of distributed load on our beam. Let's check a look at the other shapes to see if they match our expectations. Square 45 checks out what we'd expect. Square Pac-Man, we see a solid region and then a steep slope. And square bow tie, a steep slope on either side with a flat part in the middle. Now that we can see that we are getting correct results, let's go back to our planter example, which I've embedded into a Streamlit web application. The link for this application is in the description below, so you can open it up with me and follow along. What I'm showing here is the projected load of the planter on the beam, assuming that it's across the beam this way, parallel with the x-axis. Each of these numbers here represents the value of the distributed load at each x location. The sum total of this whole load is going to equal this value here. We can change this value depending on the depth of our soil and we will see these numbers updated in concert. Below you can see the maximum projected moment using this as a distributed load across a whole simply supported span beam compared to what a smeared moment would look like if this total load were distributed as a uniform distributed load across the beam. We can see that in this orientation of the planter, the smeared moment is over 20% conservative, meaning there's potential cost savings for our building owner. However, notice here I've also got a rotation slider. Every time we change the rotation, the distributed load changes also. And as we rotate, we start to see that more of the load gets concentrated in the center of the beam, meaning that the smeared moment is not conservative. And in fact, if we were to put planters on any of our beams off of the original axis, we will end up needing to use this distributed load because the load will in fact be higher. But as we keep increasing the angle, we come to this point here. If we've turned our planters completely 90 degrees to the beam, now the load gets distributed entirely 
towards the ends of the beam. And as long as our beam is good and sheer, we have the potential to add massive value for our building owner client by suggesting they rotate the planters 90 degrees. This might even prevent having to do any roof upgrades because all of our load is toward the end of the beams where the supports are. I've also created this other example here using random polygons. You can generate polygons with the button here. For a very basic polygon, we'd have something very similar to a uniform distributed load. Likewise, if we generated a new polygon, we get more load concentrated toward the center. As we increase the weirdness of our polygon, we will continually have more load concentrated into the center. This implies that quite often, if we have an irregularly shaped load, it's not conservative to use a uniform distributed load to represent it. Therefore, it would be very important for us to be able to do this kind of basic modeling for any of our clients if they have a load that's not going to be rectilinear. Now, you might be out there saying, Connor, this is a pretty contrived example. And I would say, you're right. But the point of all this is not to be able to have a solution for these kinds of weird one-off problems. We can use a tool like this in other software projects to say, draw loads wherever you want and have a beam automatically know where the loads are. That's where we're going with this. One final note, I called this video an unsolved engineering problem. That's because I do not know of a general purpose, free and open source solution available to everybody to use to solve this problem of an arbitrarily shaped load on a beam. If you do know of an implementation that I have missed, let me know and I'd be happy to change the name of this video. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe because there's always more coming. If you're excited to incorporate Python into your own practice, I encourage you to enroll in my course, Python for Structural Engineers. In my own experience, structural engineers use Python in ways that are unique from programmers or data scientists. The difference is we don't just do analysis, we do design and documentation. The course is offered throughout the year to a limited number of participants. I do intakes in different time zones. Go to structuralpython.com to learn more about the course and also how you can enroll in a free mini course where I teach you a new method of doing design calculations using the open source libraries, hand calcs, and for all people. I look forward to seeing you.